Thank you all. It's uh, great to see everyone here. Um, I, uh, I actually got in, I'm, I, I'm from New York, I got in very early this morning, so I'm a little bit jet lagged, but that's okay. I've got energy and I'm excited because I'm talking about one of my favorite things in the entire world, which is Go. And I'm here with a bunch of other people who are also excited about um, uh, talking and, and hearing about Go. Uh, I thought it would be mostly, uh, like everyone here would be from uh, Singapore as we saw earlier. Uh, no, we have actually about half the crowd is, has come from elsewhere because they are that interested in, uh, uh, in, in learning about Go. Uh, I, as Audrey mentioned, I work at Stripe on the observability team. Um, uh, Stripe, we provide a simple and unified API that enables businesses of all sizes to accept payments online. Stripe is, is available in, uh, I believe, 25 countries worldwide, including, yes, uh, Singapore is one of them. Uh, if you take a Grab taxi back home uh, after this conference, uh, congratulations, uh, you are now a Stripe customer. And yes, as I already mentioned, I am also the uh, person um, in some ways responsible for, for this conference. Um, how many people are enjoying themselves here today? Yeah. No, no, like I, I don't want to see it. I want to hear it. Yeah. yeah, OK, that's what I thought. Uh, so uh, I take responsibility for that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, my responsibility in being involved with this conference um, begins and ends with those 140 characters right there. So really, the applause should be for everyone else who actually, Sashong and everyone who was involved in actually doing uh, the rest of it, you know, putting it all together and, and all of that, that tail stuff. So let's give it up for them. How many? So we have people here from, who are not from Singapore as well. How many people would be interested in, um, in more Go conferences? Let, let, let's hear it. Like, I, you know. I, I feel like I saw like 30 people raise their hands and then like heard two, two people say anything. So let's try that again. How many people would actually be interested in seeing more Go conferences elsewhere? OK, there we go. So uh, it turns out that I apparently am making um, a hobby, if not a profession, of uh, getting other people to organize Go conferences <laughs> on my behalf by doing absolutely nothing but tweeting, which is a really great thing to, and so far I've failed to yet, like, you know, to get paid for this um, as like a recruiting or consulting fee, but anyway. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing a Go conference in Sydney, for example. Um, now, Manish has agreed to organize this um, as long as Rob Pike does the keynote, which I feel like we can, organize, we can work that out. He's since deleted his Twitter account, but that's OK. Deleting your Twitter account doesn't get you off the hook for, for this sort of thing once you've agreed to it. So um, if this is something that you're interested in, you know exactly who to talk to, who to tweet at, and, and what hashtag to use. But now for the actual uh, meat of this talk, uh, which is about interfaces. When I first started writing Go, which was actually five years ago now at this point, I saw interfaces as a limited form of inheritance. So I used interfaces from the standard library when they were needed, but I converted them to concrete types as soon as possible. And I basically never saw the need to actually write my own. But that changed once I started to work on larger projects, like the Twitter client library for Go, which I maintain, uh, Git Go, which is a pure impl Go implementation of Git, or Veneur, which is actually uh, the main project I work on these days. Um, I spoke uh, just two days ago at Mondorama in Portland about that. You can check out that talk if you're interested in how that works. But so as I started working on these much larger media projects, um, I realized that I got three big wins from using interfaces. Interfaces meant that I could write less code and still get this, the job done. But also, my code was more robust, and it was much more flexible. So my goal here today is to distill the lessons that I've learned about interfaces and inspire everyone to take full advantage of the power that they, that they give in their code. So just a very brief, because uh, I don't have much time, quick refresher on interfaces, what they are and how they work in Go. So here are three basic uh, interface types. Um, error is the most common one. Um, if you've written pretty much any Go code at any point, you've probably uh, used an error. Oops. Uh, the, and the main thing to understand with, uh, with interfaces is that any struct that provides a method matching one of these exact signatures satisfies the corresponding interface. And note, it has to be the exact signature. It has to match the method name and the number and types of arguments that it takes, and as well as the name, or sorry, the, the number and types of values that it returns. The IO package defines some interfaces with interacting with data, like reading, writing, or closing data sources. And in Go, the os.file type implements uh, all three of those interfaces, but some types are just going to implement a subset. They might implement just one or two of those, of those interface types. 
And we can combine two or more interfaces as well. And combining works exactly as we'd expect. So a read closer is anything that's both a reader and a closer. A read seeker is anything that's both a reader and, you guessed it, a seeker. If you aren't familiar with seek, by the way, it basically has to say, like, you know, take this entire data stream and rather than reading all the way to the 50th byte, just jump right to the 50th byte. Um, so, but by combining small and single method interfaces, we get precision. So not all readers have to support close or seek operations if that's not what we need. But if we are writing a function that expects to be able to both read the input and seek to arbitrary places in the input, we can specify that. We have a way of doing that. And we also get helper functions. So here are two from the, uh, from the IOUtil package. Uh, read all will take um, a stream and turns it into a static slice of bytes. And no up closer provides a, a dummy close method that performs no action. It's really a hack in the type system to allow us to use a vanilla reader where a function expects a read closer, but our reader doesn't, closing it doesn't make any sense. We don't need to close it. Now, IO interfaces are among the most powerful in the standard library, so it's worth looking at what makes them powerful. And these are some of the three things that might jump out at us first. They abstract a lot of common functionality. And they also give us a lot of granularity. So uh, we can specify the exact contract that we need. We don't have to make all readers also satisfy write and close if that doesn't make sense for them. We can specify uh, which functions or which functionality we're going to use. And of course, we get a lot of helper functions that, that uh, allow us to glue them all together. It just sort of uh, fills, in, fills in the gaps and makes them more convenient to use. But then we look at the error interface, which is also pretty powerful. Um, error in the IO interfaces are pretty much are the most uh, widely spread, widely used in both the standard library and also um, other Go code. But they're powerful for the opposite reasons. They abstract basically no functionality. Error doesn't abstract anything at all. Um, they provide no granularity, and there are almost no helper functions that go along with it. You can maybe count errors.new as a helper function, but if that. Um, and so, what gives? Why is it that these are both really powerful interfaces, but the reasons that make them powerful are completely different? As it turns out, there is a way for us to be able to reconcile uh, these differences and come up with a common framework for understanding what defines a powerful interface. And it all comes down to this. Interfaces should be humble and disciplined. They should specify the weakest possible assumptions that need to be made about our code. So if our, my function uses an os.file, but it only ever calls the read method on it, I don't need to require an os.file uh, as an input. An io.reader is actually better because it makes a smaller assumption. And it also signals that the important thing about the input is its ability to be read from, as opposed to all the many other things that an os.file is capable of doing. So like in this function signature right here, we don't even know what, the, what, what it does. We know it's called parse file, and it takes in an, a reader, not a file, and it returns a config and an error. You can pretty much guess that it's parsing a config file, but we also know that the only thing it's really allowed to do to that input is read from it. We know that it can't you know, change the ownership or delete the file or do any of those other things. I mean, it can if you do a type assertion or something, but you, know, you, you really have to go out of your way to go beyond that, go beyond that uh, contract. And of course, it's also more testable because it's much easier to stub in an IO reader than it is to stub in an os.file. But secondly, what, it keeps us disciplined because whatever assumptions or contracts are necessary, they're all going to be enforced by the compiler. So the IO interfaces and the error stringer interfaces are, are powerful because they follow both of these, even though they do so in radically different ways. Now that we know what makes a powerful interface when we see it, we want to know why should we, when should we use an interface instead of uh, a struct? And it's easier to answer that question in reverse. What are the reasons that we might not use interfaces? So from, I've asked a lot of people about this, and so from both my own experiences with Veneur, GitGo, and the Twitter client library, um, and also talking to other gophers, um, there, are five basic, there are five main reasons that people came up with. And I don't have time today. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the main two, uh, which are really the only two that matter as far as I'm concerned. Because they're really actually just fears of inter writing interfaces badly, writing interfaces that are too complicated or specify the wrong methods. And so people think, well, I don't know what the right interface to use is, so I'm just going to write a struct instead. And they see structs as the default choice. But that's actually backwards. If you don't know what type to use, that's actually exactly when you should use an interface instead of a struct, if you don't know how you're going to need to interact with it. 
If you're interested, um, the title for the slide is actually the title of a um, also longer talk that I gave on uh, so, uh, going into all five of those. Um, you can find find the video online. But I'll share just a quick story of how when writing Gitgo, I stopped seeing uh, structs as the as the default choice. Um, again, Gitgo is a pure Go implementation of Git, and when reading a repository. Gitgo doesn't actually need to know the name of the current directory it's operating out of. It just needs to be able to read or write to files within that directory. And so initially, we used a string to represent that directory rather than the file system interface from the standard library because, well, an interface felt like overkill. And we didn't know which methods we would need on that interface. But in actuality, we were performing lots of actions based on the string input, and each of those carried an assumption. We just weren't specifying those assumptions explicitly, so we didn't realize that some of those restrictions that we were placing were actually unnecessary. The main one is that because the way we're interacting with the data, we were requiring repositories to be local. So by replacing the input, uh, the string input, with the interface that, that specified the correct and minimal contract for the type actually removed that assumption, and it gave us the ability to read repositories over the network for essentially for free. So by relaxing the, uh, by that um, unnecessary assumption, we can read repo remote repositories without cloning the whole repo first. And that's, that's the crux of it, is that any, uh, if it's there, you're going to use it. Every time we write, every time we're, uh, we're, uh, interfaces restrict what is actually there and, and prevents us from being able to make additional assumptions that we're not even aware of. Anytime you access a field or use, uh, or use a method on a type, you're making an assumption about both what, it's, what is there and how it behaves. By using interface types, it restricts us to only the assumptions that we know that we are making explicitly, and it removes the ability for us to accidentally impose assumptions that are either uh, unnecessary or, in some cases, altogether flat out wrong. So whether we're modeling our interfaces after both I or error, or because they just follow very different patterns, there's some, there's some tricks we can keep in mind for, for how to write them. The big one when designing interfaces like the I.O. interface of the standard library is that we want, to, we want to be minimal in our entire approach. Don't write helper methods, don't, write, uh, don't even define methods on the interface, don't define fields on the interface until you're absolutely sure you're going to need them. Because the contracts you want to provide should be the minimal required contract to getting the job done. There's nothing worse than trying to use an interface or implement an interface and finding that it's got 10 definitions, it's got, it specifies 10 methods and three of them are deprecated and another two you actually don't even really need but you have to because they're defined on the interface type and then there are the other five that you actually really care about. That is not a humble interface. That is an incredibly, incredibly arrogant interface. Um, instead, you create composite interface types that will allow you to group the functionality that, that you actually need, uh, or allow you to group it by uh, the way that those types will, um, the way that those behaviors will interact with each other. And when writing interfaces like error, um, asking interfaces how they behave is a, is a, is a pretty powerful idiom. So um, I won't go too much into this, but basically, instead of defining a concrete error type and, and type switching on that, we can, for example, in this case, uh, we, can provide in, uh, we can provide another method, uh, the delay, and define a local interface type to, just to ask, do you respond to this? Do you, do you give us an ability to, to, look at, uh, to look for a delay value? And if it does, we can, we can then, that can uh, control our code flow. We can then uh, understand how to respond to that error. And that's much better than switching on a concrete error type because concrete types can change. But again, that's the minimal contract. We don't really care what, in, what the error type is. We just care in this case that it gives us a delay attribute. Um, and of course, this is not just limited to the error um, interface type, it's just the most common one where you'll see this pattern, and so it makes for an easy example. So I'll close by saying that, by, by leaving you with just a thought experiment, particularly for those of you who are interested in dipping your toes in the water with uh, interface types. I'm not going to say that this is exactly how we should write all of our Go code, or, e or even you know, most of it, but it is a good way to orient ourselves. And it's a great exercise for understanding what it means to treat interfaces as truly first-class citizens in Go. What if we really could never export our struct types? In fact, what if the only types that we could ever export in our packages were interface types 
or uh, first class functions. And this helps us really see what, it, what, inter, what first class interface values and interface types can be. Because the more that we treat interfaces as first class citizens in Go, the more that we can reuse existing code. And the more we treat interface types as first class citizens in Go, the more we can lean on the compiler to validate those contracts that our code is making. And the more that we treat interfaces as first class citizens in Go, the more we can free our code of those extraneous or even incorrect assumptions that we're making. And this right here is the hidden power of interfaces. They're a humble feature, but when we're disciplined about them, they can be insanely powerful. Thank you. I think there's um, one. Oh. One question. Um, important question, what's your favorite board game? <laughs> the question was, what is my favorite board game? Uh, oh, God. Um, sorry? Sorry, what did you say? Oh, um, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, the game that I've been really, I really loved a lot recently uh, is Scythe. Uh, I got, I backed it on Kickstarter um, when it came out. Uh, it's basically a steampunk, a steampunk, yeah, I guess steampunk-ish World War One era alternate reality version of Risk, except it doesn't take ten hours to play. Um, it's only like maybe an hour and a half or two hours if you have if you have the right people. Um, I actually got, since I backed on Kickstarter, I got the collector's edition, which probably could go for like easily 800 bucks for only like 200. Um, but uh, you, can, you can find, you can find um, probably like the normal editions for a, a pretty decent amount. Highly, highly recommend if you like games like Risk but don't want to lose all your friends to dying of boredom. More questions? I have one. You said that you listen to embarrassing music. Do you want to share what kind of music you listen to? Oh, God, yes. Um, I will happily trade playlists or like music collections with absolutely anybody um, there is. Uh, I will s it's not really embarrassing, but it probably do, like, completely crushes any um, credibility I would ever have as like, you know, an indie guy like, you know, or just you know, street kid when it comes to music. Um, I really love uh, super kitschy, super... Um, uh, what's the word? Um, super kitschy, super. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, I like um, it's it's the music it's the music equivalent of like pop art, like as in like visual art. Um, so for example, um, like remixes and mashups, um, they're great. Like I love it. It's not just like about creating music that like mixes well together, but it's about like actually creating a statement with like the two things that you're able to mix well together. Um, I'm trying to think. There's one example. Oh yeah, there's a great example here. There's um, there are two songs that are both about the Cold War era. Um, completely different sound, Safety Dance and, um, uh, and uh, Holiday in Cambodia. They don't, you'd think they wouldn't go well together at all, but when you mix them together, it's actually, a, both, they sound really great, but it's a really amazing statement to think about you know, what, that, what both of those songs actually meant in, those, in that period. So it's, a, it's about like, taking something that's super kitschy and then turning it into something that's really meaningful. And yeah, as I said, um, if this video ever gets published, um, I will absolutely never have any uh, chance of being a senior editor at Pitchfork <laughs> reviewing music. I'm OK with that decision. Great. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Now, now we, we can finally uh, do a two-brain and a stage training with him.